Welcome to the Sonocyte Behind the Scan webinar called An Introduction, Introduction to Vexus. My name is Laura Jacob and I will be moderating, moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, please be advised all attendees are muted. You may type your questions into the Q&A box in the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen at any time. We will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference on our webinar's website. Here with us today, we have Dr. Katie Wiskar. Dr. Wiskar is a general internist at Vancouver General Hospital. She completed her core internal medicine and general internal medicine fellowship at the University of British Columbia. She completed a year of POCUS fellowship, including six months of critical care ultrasound fellowship at Western University in London, Ontario. Her POCUS passions include VEXUS and POCUS evaluation of volume status, all things echocardiography, and clinical integration of ultrasound findings. Outside of medicine, you can find her on the beach, volleyball court, hiking in the mountains, or playing with her two sons. And with that, Dr. Wiskar, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, and thank you guys for joining me here today. I'm really thrilled to be talking today about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so without further ado, today our objectives are one to talk about how to perform a VEXIS exam, which is a venous excess ultrasound exam, uh, to understand how to interpret the waveforms that comprise a VEXIS exam. We'll talk a little bit about caveats and pitfalls, and then we'll go through a couple examples of how this can be integrated into your clinical decision making. So to start off with, what is venous congestion and why do we care about it? Why is it so important? Um, so for a long time, when we talked about organ perfusion, we talked a lot about the left side, the arterial side, uh, about cardiac output, about mean arterial pressure. Um, but increasingly, we're coming to realize the importance of the venous side. Uh, after all, when we talk about organ perfusion, tissue perfusion is going to be your MAP minus your CVP. And especially as we talk about the capillary beds where arterial pressures are actually very low, CVP becomes a really uh, important force for organ perfusion. So we're increasingly recognizing that venous congestion is critical for organ perfusions and almost every organ in the body can be negatively affected by venous congestion, by excess fluid and fluid overload. Um, so the, the most common and well-recognized example here is it's obviously pulmonary edema in the lungs, uh, but this can affect the whole body. So cerebral edema in the brain, uh, congestive nephropathy, congestive hepatopathy, gut edema, um, tissue edema and poor wound healing, the list goes on. So this is something that we really want to recognize and try to address if it's present. Now, part of the reason why this was under-recognized for so long is we haven't always had great tools to assess the venous side. Um, we've had, you know, CBP monitors or swan gans catheters, but obviously those aren't accessible in all patients. Um, you know, we have physical exam, but as I'm sure most of you recognize, staring at the neck veins is far from a perfect technique. Uh, and even with ultrasound, so when the IVC came around, this was kind of heralded as the answer to volume status questions, which uh, it is not. <laughs> it can certainly be useful, but is not as specific as we would like for volume overload and can be confounded by other things. Um, and even as we talk about lung ultrasound, and I'm a huge proponent of lung ultrasound, uh, but lung ultrasound tells us about, you know, the left side congestion in the lungs kind of backing up from the left side of the heart, but doesn't really tell us about what's going on in the rest of this, the systemic circulation, kind of the right side, the venous system. So enter Vexus. Uh, so as I said, Vexus stands for the venous excess ultrasound grading system. So this was an idea put forth in a paper just a couple of years ago by uh, William Bovian Souligny and his colleagues. Um, and what they did is they essentially built on the notion that intra-abdominal vessels, so in particular, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the intrarenal veins all have um, predictable Doppler waveforms. So when we interrogate them with Doppler, they have a set waveform under normal physiologic circumstances. And they, those waveforms will predictably change with increasing congestion. Now, it was not new. Uh, and each of those waveforms had literature behind it going back years, sometimes decades, uh, primarily in heart failure populations, cardinal, renal disease, et cetera. Uh, but what this group did that was novel is they suggested a, a combined sort of scoring system, combining these three waveforms to try to you know, develop a metric that was more sensitive, more specific for uh, harmful venous congestion. Uh, and they looked specifically at a post-cardiac surgery population 
and their outcome that they, was that they were interested in was the development of acute kidney injury. So this is just a graph from that paper again. And again, the whole premise here is that each of these vessels, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the intrarenal vein, all have waveforms under normal physiologic conditions. And you can see that these change with increasing right atrial pressure, increasing congestion. And we'll go, we'll talk a bit more through kind of interpreting these waveforms. Um, this is kind of a, a busy slide from the paper. The important part here is kind of this, this circled vexus C column in the middle. So what this group did um, in their paper is they proposed several sort of combinations of scoring systems. And they tried to validate in their population which of them had the best predictive value, um, the best predictive capabilities for AKI. And what they found is that this vexus C grading uh, performed the best. So this is the one that you want to remember. This is the one that we use now in ultrasound practice. And as you can see here, the IVC is kind of like your gatekeeper. So if you have an IVC that is small and collapsible um, that you are, are sure of is a good tracing, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You, you don't have significant venous congestion. Uh, in contrast, if you have severe abnormalities in multiple waveforms, uh, then you're more likely to have severe congestion, and that's associated in this study with a higher incidence of the development of acute kidney injury. And their hazard ratio here was just under three. Now, this is a pretty recent paper, so the evidence for this and kind of using the scoring system is still in evolution, but there have been a couple groups who've looked at this. Uh, one group looked particularly at all of the individual components they interestingly found that the hepatic vein was the most predictive. That was Spiegel, Roy Spiegel and his colleagues. Uh, and then a recent paper in the Indian Journal of Critical Care looked to validate the VEXA score and again found that a high VEXA grade was predictive of acute kidney injury. And these were patients admitted with cardiorenal syndrome. And as I said before, each of the individual waveform components do have, some, in some cases, decades of supporting evidence in particular populations, usually the heart failure population. And just to speak to that, so this is a paper from 2016 uh, by Tang et al, and was actually speaking primarily to intrarenal um, venous patterns. But this is a really nice graph just to show once again that these different vessels all have predictable changes in their Doppler waveforms with increasing congestion. Uh, you see the renal artery included here. We're not really going to talk about that today as that isn't included in the VEXIS protocol, uh, but that vessel also does have kind of changes with congestion. Here we just see the inferior vena cava. And again, we won't really talk about um, tissue Doppler and kind of tricuspid inflows here. So with that all being said, how do we actually do this? So to start off with the IVC is part of the VESIS exam. So you're always gonna wanna get your IVC first. Um, and I won't really belabor how to do this. Most of you I'm sure are familiar with how to obtain an IVC view. Um, I will just say that in addition to your standard long axis IVC view, where you see the right atrium, the hepatic vein, a nice segment of the intrahepatic IVC, I'd really encourage you to try to get a short axis view of the IVC. And what this does is this kind of corroborates your findings and help you avoid some common uh, pitfalls of the IVC. One common pitfall is that occasionally we can get significant lateral translation of the IVC with respiration. So in a long axis, you may think you're seeing collapse, but we're actually just getting the IVC move laterally out of your plane with respiration. So a short axis helps avoid that pitfall. It also gives you a better idea of the shape of the IVC. Uh, and we'll talk about, about this a bit more about this later. To obtain a short axis, of course, all you're gonna do is rotate your probe 90 degrees from your long axis view. And you can do this with either your curvilinear or your phase rate probes. Moving on to the hepatic vein. So I used to acquire the hepatic vein, um, as you see here, as you see here on screen, right? From a sub xiphoid approach, because you'll usually notice as you go to get your long axis IVC view that of course you see the hepatic vein coming off of it. Um, and that's not wrong at all. You can totally interrogate it from this view. I tend now more to favor, uh, as you see here on screen left. So a lateral approach kind of transhepatically scanning in a coronal plane just because I find that this view gives a nicer Doppler waveform because the orientation of the veins with respect to your probe is optimized. Uh, but wherever you're gonna go, again, here you can use a phased array probe or a curvilinear probe. I tend to use a curvilinear probe just because it's gated a bit better for these low velocities. Um, the biggest advantage of the, of the phased, if you want to, is that if you have it available, you can attach ECG gating. Uh, but wherever you are, you're gonna identify your hepatic vein and then you're gonna use color to make sure you have good signal in your vessels. 
once you have that, you're going to use pulse wave Doppler, place your Doppler gate right in the middle of your vessel uh, and obtain your waveform here. And what you should see is a nice normal hepatic vein waveform that has technically four components, your A and V waves above the baseline and your S and D waves below. Really, we're going to pay attention to the S and D waves seen in systole and diastole respectively. Uh, and as a warning, your waveforms will never look this nice. This is like the nicest waveform I've ever gotten on a hepatic vein. Um, normally they're a bit messier than this. Moving on to the portal vein. So here again, you can obtain this uh, scanning sort of subcostal along the costal margin uh, along the belly, but I find it much easier from a lateral approach in a coronal plane. Usually here, a little bit of fanning, a little bit of sliding your probe inferiorly will easily identify the portal vein. And you'll be able to identify it because it's bordered by this bright hyperechoic fat with thick walls. And when you put color on, you'll see this nice red hepatopetal flow, so flowing towards the probe. So once again, once you've got your vessel identified with color, you're going to use pulse wave Doppler and identify this nice continuous sort of respiro with some gentle respirophasic undulations. You may have to identify who to adjust so your baseline and your scale here. But this flow above the baseline is what we're looking for here. There's a bit of noise under the baseline here, uh, but this is what we're after. This normal continuous low grade flow. Finally, in terms of acquisition, we'll talk about the intrarenal veins. So here, once again, we're gonna find the kidneys in the usual manner, scanning in the flank and a coronal plane. Um, here, color of course is key because these vessels are so small that they're not otherwise visible. Uh, and once you have ideally a good color tracing, making sure that your Nyquist limit is a turned down appropriately low because this is a very low velocity flow here. And I should say you can actually use color power Doppler, and sometimes I will do that instead of uh, normal color Doppler, just to get that low velocity flow. And then you're going to try to interrogate a vessel that's in the renal cortex or at the corticomedullary junction. You want to try to avoid the vessels that are in the renal pelvis as those will be affected by other factors. So you're going for sort of the, that cortex or the corticomedullary junction. You'll drop your pulse wave Doppler again and obtain a tracing that looks something like this. Again, adjusting your scale and your baseline appropriately. And the flow that we're interested in is this continuous low grade flow below the baseline. Now you'll see that above the baseline, we have a tracing that looks arterial because that's our renal, an intrarenal artery. It's quite normal to catch both of these on the same waveform as these vessels are paired, so travel together. But what we're interested in for our purposes in the, in the VEXIS exam is this low grade flow beneath the baseline here that is continuous under normal physiologic conditions. Uh, again, I would recommend doing all of these, the hepatic, the portal, and the intrarenal vein, typically with a curvilinear probe. You can use the phase um, as I've done here, but I find the curvilinear gives you slightly better resolution uh, and is better gated for these low velocities. All right, so we'll talk a bit now about interpretation. So obviously with your IVC, uh, under normal circumstances, what you're looking for is a collapsible kind of oval ellipsoid shaped IVC. And again, the short axis is a really nice check to make sure what you're seeing is true collapse rather than just lateral translation. It also gives you a much better idea of the shape uh, because we know that under normal physiologic conditions, the IVC is oval shaped. So depending on where you're cutting it, you may actually measure say 2.1 centimeters, but you may actually have an IVC that is not kind of really plethoric. So in the VEXIS um, criteria, they did use a cutoff of two centimeters. However, um, I know because I've talked to Philippe Rolla, who's one of the authors several times about this, um, the, their group feels that the, the more important criteria is really sort of plethora and shape of the IVC. They use the two centimeter cutoff in the long axis because that's what avail was available in their data. Um, but really more important is to try to get a sense of the shape of the IVC and how plethoric and non-varying it is, rather than paying too much attention to an absolute number cutoff. So contrast these IVCs with here, you can see an IVC that is clearly plethoric, is clearly non-varying. And in the short axis, you can see it is very round and spherical. Um, so that is really suggestive of an IVC um, in the setting of elevated right atrial pressures. So if you have a large IVC like this, a plethoric IVC, you'll continue and do the rest of your VEXIS exam. In terms of interpreting the hepatic vein, so under normal physiologic conditions, most of your flow has been below the baseline here, and you should have your S wave being greater than your D wave, or here they're kind of just about the same. 
Uh, but under normal conditions, again, if we go over one, we probably have S and then D. Sometimes in tachycardia, they may fuse slightly together, but you should see uh, your S wave being the predominant component here. In contrast, as we progress through increasing congestion, the first thing you'll get will be your D wave becoming greater in amplitude than your S wave. And finally, in settings of severe congestion, you'll actually see reversal of the S wave above the baseline. Uh, now, this occurs almost always in the setting of some tricuspid regurgitation um, because your, your TR jet is going to be what's responsible for that backflow of blood back up the hepatic vein up towards the probe in systole when normally blood should be flown down through the hepatic vein towards the heart. Now, theoretically, you can get a reversed S wave in the absence of TR uh, under certain conditions such as severe RV dysfunction, heart block, um, very prolonged PR interval, et cetera. Um, practically, I don't know if I've ever seen that. It's almost always in the setting of at least sort of mild to moderate TR where you're getting this S wave reversal here. Moving on to interpreting the portal vein. So as I said, normal should be a continuous low grade flow with some respirophasic variation and less than 30% pulsatility. Um, so pulsatility, we're talking about our maximum minus our minimum. Um, in contrast, as you progress through at first mild congestion and then severe congestion, you're going to get increasing pulsatility. Uh, so mild congestion is 30 to 50%. And the image I put here on the left is actually a bit misleading because this is clearly almost 100% congestion. Uh, so this scan would be consistent with severe congestion. Here on the right, we have very severe congestion where we actually have some reversal of flow uh, below the baseline. So clearly more than 50% pulsatility, uh, very severe congestion, probably also occurring in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation. Finally, interpreting the intrarenal veins. So once again, normal flow should be continuous below the baseline with really minimal variation. As you progress through mild congestion, you'll see a biphasic pattern appear. So distinct waves in systole, S here, and diastole. And finally, in very severe congestion, you will get monophasic flow in diastole only. So a few pitfalls and caveats. So first, some technical things. Um, the hepatic vein can be quite difficult to interpret without ECG. This is an example here where it's a little bit difficult to tell what's going on. This here might be an S wave. This might be a D wave. Here we maybe have S reversal. Uh, but without ECG leads, this can get quite tricky. So I would encourage you, especially as you're learning and practicing, if you have ECG leads at your disposal, uh, to go ahead and hook those up. Especially in tachycardic patients, it can get quite challenging. Next, uh, you will see respiratory translation of these vessels because they're quite small targets, especially in patients who may be uh, hypoxic or, or struggling to breathe. Um, you can see quite significant respiratory translation of the intra-abdominal organs. And you can see here this waveform is kind of coming in and out of view, making it a bit difficult to determine what sort of the maximal and minimal points here. This is a portal vein tracing. Uh, so if your patient is able, asking, asking them to hold their breath uh, is really useful, especially if you're intravenal uh, vessels. Um, and really the kidneys are extremely challenging, um, definitely good to practice, but I will say that in the patient's eye scan, probably 30% of the time, I get a really good intravenal vein tracing that I'm confident in. Um, so don't feel bad if you find that exam very difficult. Um, everyone I've talked to, including people who use this on a daily basis, uh, do find that challenging. And that's often often just a product of the patients who we are scanning in hospital. Most patients are acutely unwell, um, may have tissue edema, may have other factors that make it challenging. A few other things to note. So as we went through briefly uh, initially, the evidence behind this is growing, but thus far is you know, limited to specific patient populations. I don't think that's a reason not to use these techniques uh, because the alternative, the alternatives for you know, assessing venous congestion and right-sided congestion are not great and also don't have a lot of great evidence to support them, but just something to keep in mind um, as the evidence base evolves. It's also worth saying that there are other pathologies that can affect each of these waveforms. And that's part of why it's really nice to try to do the entire VEXUS exam um, and to try to take each of these waveforms and combine the data for them, because that um, you know, somewhat eliminates uh, potential errors if one waveform, say, may be affected by cirrhosis, for example, affecting the hepatic and portal veins or increased intra-abdominal pressure uh, or intrinsic renal disease are common things that can affect those waveforms. Um, whereas if you have 
three waveforms that all look like congestion, that paints a stronger picture in favor of, you know, that clinical conclusion of elevated right-sided pressures. Finally, super important with any ultrasound talk uh, is to always interpret your ultrasound findings in the context of the entire clinical picture. This is one data point. Um, you should never base decisions on a single data point. Um, try to avoid the quote unquote vexus Lasix or vexus furosemide reflex. Um, firstly, again, because you want to take the entire clinical picture into consideration. And also because, you know, findings of increased congestion typically should be addressed, but diuresis is not the only way to do so. So for example, if you have a patient with significant right-sided failure, another way to address their systemic congestion may be, you know, to adjust their mechanical ventilation settings if they're intubated or inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, et cetera. So make sure you're still considering the entire clinical picture uh, and consider that the goal for everyone is not to live at a vexus zero, um, especially in patients with concomitant uh, heart failure, right heart failure, left heart failure. For some people, they may not be able to live with a small collapsible IVC, and they may always live with some degree of elevated right atrial pressure um, in sort of their compensated state. So keep that in mind that, you know, this is not a cookie cutter approach and has to be individualized to the patient in front of you. Finally, a few practical tips. I think I've addressed most of these. Uh, breath holding in, in cooperative patients is really helpful, especially for your renals. ECG leads are helpful if they're available. Um, and finally, I know I said, try to look at everything if available and absolutely do. But if you can only get one waveform, uh, the portal vein can be useful. And I do use this sometimes in patients in whom their hepatic is too hard to interpret, uh, their kidneys are not obtainable. The portal vein is typically the easiest to obtain, is the most reliable to interpret, um, and does kind of change more readily than the hepatic vein. Um, you will have patients, and we'll see in our example case, Shortly, you'll have patients in whom their hepatic vein will always be abnormal, especially if they have moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation, just because the hepatic vein is so close to that right atrium, so close to that backflow of TR. Um, so their waveform may never normalize, whereas the portal vein with a bit more distance um, will better show sort of changes with diuresis or, or, or excess fluid if you're going in the wrong direction. So the portal vein can in and of itself be quite useful. All right, going forward and putting everything together, we're gonna to go through just a couple cases here. This first case, this was a young, young gentleman with a hematologic malignancy on chemotherapy uh, who'd had a lot of infectious complications, uh, what had been quite stable on the ward and then sort of rapidly overnight developed new hypoxia and hypotension. So our ultrasound team was asked to come assess him. Now, I won't show you his whole lung scan as that's obviously not the focus of today. Um, but suffice it to say that his entire lungs essentially looked like this with a few sort of spared areas of A-lines, but predominantly a B-line pattern throughout his lungs. Again, I won't show his whole cardiac exam, but this was a surprising and new finding. Uh, he previously had a normal echo from less than a year ago, but here we see obviously a decreased ejection fraction that again was new for this patient. So we looked at his IVC. Um, and it does look quite collapsible here. We wanted to be sure of our findings in this case, because this was a young gentleman who was um, taking very big breaths, obviously exerting significant respiratory effort, significant sort of pressure, intrathoracic pressure changes. Uh, so we wanted to be sure that these findings weren't a lateral translation or just an effect of his substantial work of breathing. So his short axis is, you know, again, reassuring. It does look fairly ellipsoid in shape, but we did go ahead and just check his hepatic vein. And this was quite reassuring. So here we see an S and D pattern, essentially the same size. So consistent um, with likely a normal state, perhaps very, very mild congestion if you thought that D wave was bigger, but overall very reassuring. Um, so here, even with just these findings, we were confident enough to say that despite the findings of new decreased ejection fraction and diffuse B lines in this patient, that his new hypoxia was probably not predominantly from pulmonary edema, uh, and that this seemed more likely to be uh, an evolving ARDS, an infectious picture, et cetera, based on the fact that there really wasn't any evidence of um, you know, venous congestion. His lung findings, as I said, also did demonstrate skipped areas, which would be less in keeping, obviously, with pulmonary edema. Next, moving on to case number two. So this was a seven-year-old woman with known heart failure, coronary disease, AFib, 
an ovarian cancer thought to be in remission, uh, who'd recently had several admissions for acute kidney injury, including one where she was transiently on hemodialysis. And that was thought to maybe have been a pre-renal insult progressing into ATN. Uh, and she came in again with new ascites uh, of unclear etiology and another acute kidney injury. Uh, and she was a really difficult clinical volume status. Uh, and everyone was very hesitant to diurese this woman, given that she just had these AKIs, including one severe enough to land her on dialysis. So she sort of got handed off between staff over a weekend. Uh, you know, someone would try a little bit of diuresis, then she'd get fluid again. Uh, and it was really unclear from sort of traditional physical exam parameters what was going on with her, her volume status and what was the cause of her AKI. So this is her cardiac scan here. This is not a surprise, uh, but severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. You also get a sense of some abnormal septal movement here, hinting at what we see in this apical four chamber view, which is a dilated RV and significant RV dysfunction as well. And I don't have color on this, but you can probably uh, imagine that she had quite significant TR. You can see those tricuspid valve leaflets just barely co-opting there. So this was her IVC. This image sort of fanned through the IVC to look at the hepatic veins, so not ideal for assessing respirophasic change. Um, but you can appreciate that it looks fairly plethoric and also that the hepatic vein um, is quite plethoric and visible. You'll notice as you start doing this exam that in normal people who do not have venous congestion, the hepatic vein can actually be somewhat hard to find uh, just because it's so small. Whereas if you see a big juicy plump looking hepatic vein, you're probably dealing with at least mild congestion. So this was her hepatic vein tracing. So again, a really prominent sort of biphasic pattern where you have reversal of the S wave. And what we actually have up here is fu Ooh, sorry. A fusion of her S, A, and V waves um, above the baseline. So again, consistent with her severe TR. And this was actually then her portal vein. So here, once again, consistent with very severe congestion, as we can see actual reversal of flow below the baseline. Reminder that the portal vein is supposed to be continuous low grade above the baseline. So this gave us enough sort of courage to aggressively diurese this woman who, you know, had just been in dialysis, who everyone thought had a susceptibility to pre-renal AKIs, who had a very unclear kind of clinical story, um, gave us kind of the, the mental fortitude to aggressively diurese her. And she actually did very well with that. Uh, her creatinine came down back to its baseline over about a week. Uh, we also thought that given this picture, her ascites were more likely to be in keeping with heart failure as opposed to, you know, a new ovarian or a recurrence of her ovarian cancer. She did, of course, also get uh, a paracentesis with diagnostic, um, diagnostic scent on her acidic fluid, which again, were consistent with this being more of a heart failure picture rather than malignancy related and her cytology was negative, et cetera. Um, but this is her discharge exam. So this is her hepatic vein. And you can see that this hasn't really changed very much. Um, as I was saying before, especially in patients with severe TR, their hepatic veins probably uh, will never normalize just because they're so close to that backflow from the TR. But in this case here, this is her portal vein. So still abnormal, certainly, but better than it was before. And she's probably a patient who uh, will never live at Vexus Zero, given her right and left heart disease. But this was certainly an improvement. Uh, clinically, she was back at her baseline. Her creatinine was at that baseline. She felt very well. So this may be her normal. Um, unfortunately, I don't have kind of an outpatient Vexus. That's sort of the next step is to get everyone doing Vexus in their clinics. So we have documented outpatient Vexus on everyone. Um, but this was really useful in this patient, both for monitoring her therapy, as well as for kind of that diagnostic picture of is, of, is this prerenal or is this congestive nephropathy? Um, all right. I think that's all I have. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wiscar, for an excellent presentation. And we will go ahead now and take some questions. Um, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. And I will just give it a moment. Um, as we're waiting for questions, uh, you can see on the slide here, this uh, shows the website for where we house our recordings of our webinars and any upcoming webinars as well. Uh, this is also a really good resource for you to contact us directly. Um, I'm waiting for questions here. Dr. Wiscar, can you, this is from me actually, uh, can you speak a little bit more about the whole outpatient Vexus? Mm -hmm. um, sounds like that might be a barrier that you're, that, that exists. Well, I mean, I think that, especially in the patients that we see in hospital, as I said, a lot of them have 
underlying heart disease, um, underlying sort of pathology such that they probably don't live at VEXA zero. So it's always this question of like, what is their baseline? Um, so, you know, if we see someone with an abnormal portal vein or abnormal renal vein, we don't know if that is their normal or if that is abnormal for them. So in an ideal world, um, you know, we'd have a a follow-up clinic maybe where we'd see these people after discharge and document their, their VEXA's exam sort of at their dry weight. Um, we don't yet have this at our hospital, a, because I practice almost all, all inpatient medicine. Um, and we don't have, we don't have the equipment in our outpatient clinic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have access to Doppler ultrasound, but I know, I know some people. So, um, some people who are very prolific with vexes on Twitter, for example, a very prominent, uh, ultrasound nephrologist who many of you may know who has excellent vexus resources uh, but he'll often post sort of follow-ups from you know clinic to hospital and that comparison point is really useful especially in these complicated patients right absolutely <clears throat> okay i'm not seeing any questions so i just want to take another moment to say thank you dr wiscar for taking the time to put together this excellent presentation for our webinar we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with our audience And thank you to everyone for joining us. Oh, looks like, oh, we did get two questions popped up just as I was saying that. Okay, for portal vein interpretation, can you explain what you mean by pulsatility Mm -hmm. and how that is estimated? Yes, of course. Um, So pulsatility, what we're looking for is, is the variation. So you can either measure this with calipers or you can eyeball it. I almost always now will sort of eyeball this, but what you're looking for is the variation between maximum, it's maximum uh, amplitude and minimum amplitude. And if you were actually, most machines, if you use your calipers and mark your maximum amplitude and your minimum amplitude, the machine itself will spit out a pulsatility index for you. Um, But the formula is basically max minus min over max um, gives you your pulsatility index. So again, you're looking for kind of how much does that vary? Okay, thank you. Are you aware of any studies showing the same findings outside of the post-op cardiac patient? Yeah, so I, as I said, there was this one study recently um, in the Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine, I think, that looked at an ICU population admitted with cardiorenal syndrome, and they looked specifically at the VEXA score and did find an association with AKI in that population. Um, And then Roy Spiegel and colleagues had looked at the waveforms individually in a general ICU population, uh, but didn't, I think, look at the kind of the summation of the VEXIS score. So I think when I had last looked, that's what's out there. I'm sure that this evidence, as I said, will continue to evolve. Um, I think Philippe Rolla and his group has something else cooking probably, um, and William Bobia Sulingi. So I think we'll start to see this more uh, in different populations. Okay, and a follow-up question from the same person. What about new hospitalizations coming out of the ED? Oh, in terms of what? Yeah, what's the question here? The, um, JM, if you could type in a little uh, additional part of your question, that would be helpful here. So the first question was just what you just answered, showing uh, the same findings outside of the post-op cardiac patient. So maybe this is what about outside new hospitalizations coming out of the ED? Oh, in terms of evidence for in term. Oh, he just responded in terms of fluid administration fluid exchange for new admit, admit patients and monitoring. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess just in terms of the general application of Vexus, um, I certainly use this in, in people coming out of the, the uh, emerge. Um, so I practice general internal medicine, almost exclusively inpatient. So we see this, you know, we see people in whom Vexus is useful a ton. The primary population in whom I find this useful um, is the cardiorenal people. So on the wards, that's where I find this the most useful. So those people who do have heart disease, who maybe have CKD, and everyone's wondering, are they, do they have congestive nephropathy or are they prerenal? Um, and I find the instinct still among, among my peers, among trainees is when people have an AKI to hold diuretics. Um, and often that's exactly the wrong thing to do, uh, especially in people with right heart failure. I see a question here about pulmonary hypertension, Mm -hmm. Uh, but especially in those patients, often it is much more of a congestive picture rather than a prerenal picture. So this, that's the population in whom I use this most, um, on the wards is that kind of cardio renal population. Okay, great. So it looks like you answered that question about pulmonary hypertension. 
Yeah, I, I guess the other the only other caveat is the in the pulmonary hypertension people. Um, that's kind of a prime example of people in whom they probably will never live at VEX is zero, right? They're always going to have some degree of elevated um, right atrial pressure and CVP. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to diurese them to the point of a VEX is zero is probably harmful. Uh, in those p- patients, what I, the the kind of scan that I will also often add is to try to look at their cardiac output as well. Um, in anyone with sort of underlying heart disease to try to get a sense as we're diuresing them. Um, if I'm over diuresing them to the point that they're now not getting enough forward flow, um, that's useful. And again, ideally you have like an outpatient baseline and you could say like, Oh, this is their portal vein when they're, you know, at their dry weight and compensated, that would be the dream. Right. Understood. Okay. And we have a quite of a, a long question here. So I'll do my best here. Um, <laughs> person, uh, Nick says, I'm in the midst of trying to set up a project to validate Vexus in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. One thing I've had difficulty deciding on is what to do with IVC as a gatekeeper for completing the remainder of the exam. As as you've said in the literature, supports IVC size, but informally there are other IVC characteristics that are important. And then even in the setting of a normal appearing IVC, you can have abnormal signals in other visceral vascular beds, Mm -hmm. but it makes it hard to decide what to do with that in literature supported mature manner. Interested. In yeah. That. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and I know, as I said, from talking to, that's awesome that you're trying to do a project of Vexus in pediatrics, by the way, like super cool. I can't see what you come up with. <laughs> um, I know informally, like in talking to Philippe Rolla that, um, you know, the finding he feels is most important. And this is kind of what I've come to in my practice as well is sort of more the shape of the IVC. So, so how spherical it is. There is some evidence to support this. So it was a study in, um, I think, 3D transesophageal echocardiography, actually. Um, but I mean, I have no reason why this wouldn't also apply, but that it basically showed that uh, sphericity of the IVC, so how round it looks, was a better predictor, was, was more correlated to CVP than other measures of either IVC size or IVC collapsibility. Um, so there is some evidence there for kind of that aspect. Um, in terms of having a normal IVC and then abnormal signals in other vascular beds, I think then you'd be invoking sort of, um, you know, organ specific dysfunction. I think if you're talking about systemic right-sided venous congestion outside of, you know, some sort of intrahepatic pathology that's compressing the IVC or, or tumor or, um, that kind of thing, you really should have a plethoric IVC if you're invoking end organ congestion in the liver and kidneys would be my take. Okay, great. Thank you for all those comments. That helps. Um, and then we have kind of a two-part question. Can this be utilized to evaluate fluid resuscitation and sepsis, i.e. to make sure we haven't over resuscitated? Yeah, I think this is definitely, this is definitely something that I have done and seen in practice. To my knowledge, the, the evidence is not here yet. Um, but again, not to say that this is not useful. I think this totally makes sense. Um, I know, especially my critical care colleagues and my emergency medicine colleagues um, who practice this exam find this to be a really useful finding because again, it's just a bit more sensitive, right? Like I think the old practice used to be like, give them fluids until, until you have to intubate them, Mm -hmm. which is not great. Um, And then, you know, give them fluids till you see beelines. And this is even an earlier stop point than that, Um, you know, to, to try to resuscitate until you start to see evidence of that right-sided venous congestion. So I think that's an excellent uh, use of this. Again, once you get pretty good at this exam, especially if you're just maybe say following the portal vein over the course of a resuscitation, that's quite a quick exam and quite easy to do. Um, so I think that's a great use for this. And hopefully in future, we'll start to see evidence in that specific population as well. Okay, great. Um, and what, what, what might be the best approach for learning this technique before getting to the point of practicing scanning? Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, this is something where there's a lot of free open access, uh, educational resources out there. So, you know, obviously through Sonosite and this webinar, um, there are on Twitter, I'm going to say Nephropocus. If you're Nephropocus, if you don't follow him, you should, he has like a tagged tweet or a pinned tweet that has a whole list that he updates of like Vexus resources. Um, that's excellent. And so there's some screencasts, there's Twitter threads. There's a whole thing. I, you know, shameless self-promotion. I have a screencast that's on my UBC I am POCUS website that talks about Vexus. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's often a lot of discussion on Twitter. If you pay attention to sort of the Vexus obsessed crowd, that is great for learning. Um, and then just go and get your hands on the bedside, ideally with someone 
um, who knows how to do this, or even with sort of remote oversight. So, you know, send your, send your clips to, to a colleague, post your clips on Twitter for feedback, that kind of thing. Cause it is really nice as you're learning this to get some feedback for someone who has some, from someone who has some experience. Right. And that sounds great. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. And I'm nervous to say thank you again because, <laughs> but here we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiskar. This was an excellent presentation. And I, I know our audience learned a lot. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great rest great. of your day. Thanks, Laura. Thank you.